today we are very privileged to have Sean, our president, to give the guided walk. This is the second time we are doing it and hence you can see that we still have a lot of issues with technical problem and then we are supported by Bien. Bien is the plant good chairperson so we have a lot of experts in the house and I think, I'm not sure whether Angie is in here but Angie, if Angie comes in, she's another expert. So without much further ado, uh, Mei Yi, do you want to show your face for a while? So that's Mei Yi, and then you can see me on Bing. So if you've got any question, do ask me and Mei Yi. Um, she's going to do all the controls, so she's a bit stressed now. So <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye to you. I'm going to switch on my video so to save some bandwidth. Um, oh, Carrie just stepped in. That's Carrie. Wave to them, Carrie. Okay, so if you've got any question, ask Carrie. I'll put him as whole soon. All right, so I'll see you in a while. Sean, it's your show. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Buddy. Uh, uh, such a privilege to be here. I'm Sean Lum uh, with the Plant Group of the Nature Society, and I'm here with my chairman, uh, Bien Tan. Uh, we're going to go for a little walk. Um, I think ba basically the Nature Society, like all of you, believes that a Singapore with nature is a better Singapore. And um, nature takes all forms from wilderness to the things that are outside your front door. And so what we're going to try to do today is um, rather than, which is often the case, we go to a specific place to highlight uh, special um, parts of the ecosystem. We're just going to go and see what could be kind of a generic in front of anybody's um, building or nearby grassy verge or park. Uh, this is the second wildflower walk. I want to thank uh, Louise Neo for kicking off this series uh, recently, and also, of course, to Tan Beng Chia, Sung Mei Yi, uh, Kerry Pereira, and of course, Bien for organizing this. Okay, so let's get uh, stuck into it. I'm going to next slide, please, uh, Mei Yi. Um, so, what we're going to do is look at um, the ecology of common wildflowers. Louise is Singapore's expert on wildflowers, what they are, what they look like, where they live. And so we're going to take a slightly different tack to maybe try to understand what is it like to be a wildflower. And uh, so what determines where plants live and in what numbers would be maybe the general ecological context. And uh, I, I, it's, wildflowers sound so much more pleasant than weed, but I suppose depending what whatever you choose to call it, what makes a Singapore wildflower a wildflower, or others would like to say a weed, a weed. What, characteris what characterizes a weed? Um, these grassy verges where these wildflowers are found, to what extent can you consider them ecosystems? And like any ecosystem, they harbor certainly some biodiversity value. So what is the value of these grassy patches outside our living, working, and play spaces? And finally, uh, this, this really came into, was highlighted during Louise's talk and also many of you observed during the circuit breaker period that the, the st uh, momentary um, stoppage of grass cutting uh, led suddenly to a diversity of, of things that we never noticed because they weren't being cut so often and, and they were being allowed to grow. So how, how can we maximize that diversity. So those are just a few of the things that we're going to try to do. And I won't, uh, I'll spend a few minutes as a general introduction and then we'll go outside for a walk. Okay, next slide, please, Mei. Thank you. Um, so if you consider what plants need, you know, all, all organisms need certain things. And for plants, it might be light, it might be moisture in the soil. Some are able to thrive with compacted soil, others not. Some can thrive in very nutrient poor conditions and others cannot. They require a fair amount of sort of rich, richer soil. Um, there's also other factors, not just the physical factors, but having to do with to what extent are these plants disturbed? And by disturbance, there's two components. How, how severe is that disturbance or intense is that disturbance and how, how often or frequently does it happen? And if you take away that disturbance, what then results? Okay, next slide, please. And by the way, these beautiful photos are from Louise, who's, who authored our definitive guide to wildflowers. So if you think about strategies, you know, what makes a wildflower a wildflower, or if, if you would, a, a weed, a weed. So I think the next slide just tries to encapsulate some of it. The next slide, please, uh, me. Um, 
and weeds have a bad connotation. I mean, look at this Brisbane City Council, help us wipe out weeds. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's an arbitrary definition. Essentially, plants that arrive uh, and grow and proliferate with any help and sometimes arrive unintentionally. And they often have the issue that they're in the wrong place or there at the wrong time. Um, so maybe the term wildflower is, is, is maybe better after all. Uh, next slide, please, Mayi. But they are really fascinating. So if we think, here's a, here's a ecological thing. Um, the British ecologist, uh, Phil Grime, put together one way that plant ecologists look at strategies. So no organism is a generalist, can live everywhere under any condition. And so plants, according to Grime, have three essential um, strategies. What, one would be to, to hunker down and compete, be there for the long term. And the life history, the strategy is really to, to uh, prevail in this competition for resources. Another group of plants, uh, what, what he called stress tolerators, they live under very, well, as the term, as the name suggests, physiological, difficult, physiologically difficult conditions, like very hot or very dry, or very salty, or very saline, very acidic. Um, those would be sort of stress conditions. And what we are going to look at is this one called the ruderals. These are plants that live in disturbed habitats. And more on that in the next slide. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, they, the ruderals are these roadside plants. They often establish on disturbed or newly available habitats. In this case, you can see there's a kind of cocoa fiber matting meant to hold down the soil. But look, the weeds, the nuts weeds, wildflowers have arrived. Um, they're effective, amazingly effective at colonizing. You kind of take your head off to their, their and, and resilient. They grow rapidly, reproduce early. I know for, for those of you who studied ecology, I guess some, sometimes these are called R strategists. Uh, and according to Grime, they call this um, the ruderal strategy. I, Mr. Lee Chiu San says the slides aren't moving. Uh, and some are saying there's an audio problem. Is that, is that Mei or Beng, can you? Um, no, I, I think um, I, I will answer that for them, but I think the slice is moving on and the sound is quite clear. Maybe they would like to check their connection. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, yep. next slide, please, Mei. I'm sorry, apologies to, to anybody who's having issues. Um, Sometimes if disturbance is limited, so you can see here's this little patch of grass that has the cow, uh, carpet grass axonopus together with one of the, 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 the small little trifoliate plant desmodium, and there is a purple vernonia. If the disturbance is limited, then these plants, the environment is stable enough where now what happens is they begin to compete because there's, there's limited disturbance. Next slide, please, Mei. Um, so what is disturbance? What do we mean in the context of our roadside wildflowers? So disturbance could mean, for example, the newly, the, the availability of a, of a new habitat. So imagine like you, uh, make, you make a road cut and all of a sudden there's exposed, exposed soil. The next slide could show another example of disturbance. Here is um, a case where a lawnmower went through a grass patch and so the stability of the system was slightly disrupted when, when the grass cutters went through. So that's another type of disturbance. And again, freak, if you can remember how intense this disturbance is, in this case, for example, how um, close to the ground you cut and, and frequency, how often are these grassy verges mown? That would be the frequency of, of disturbance. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and you can think of a, of a lawnmower is almost being like a grazing animal, you know, so um, it, for example, horses or cows graze a little bit further uh, from the soil, but sheep are able to retract their lips and therefore they can get the teeth right down to the um, uh, soil level. So essentially sheep are a lot more um, in terms of disturbance, that would be much more intense than say grazing by cattle. There's also a um, response to this mowing. So some plants can grow flat to avoid the mower altogether. 
the blades and others will get cut, but then they respond by just growing very quickly and hope, hopefully uh, reproduce before the next round of grass cutting. And they may also have some very interesting reproductive strategies. So next slide, please, uh, Mei-Yi. Uh, here, here's an example. On the, on the left, you can see the plant with the broad leaves, purplish veins. This is a strobilanthes or hemigraphus. And can you see how it has what's called a rosette, a leaf form? The leaves uh, grow in a tight spiral, are so close to the ground that chances are that they'll miss the uh, grass cutter blade. There's also a, another plant there. I think it looks like Cupid shaving brush. Um, that also has a rosette leaf, but notice the flowers are lifted up off the ground. So the hemigraphus or strobilanthes, that flowers, um, and the flower is not going to get cut, but the, the other plant, the Cupid's shaving brush, needs to get its flowers above, you know, off the ground, and, and flower and fruit before the grass cutting comes, or else it won't have been able to reproduce. Same with the hawk, hawkweed on the right, the yellow flower, uh, Yangia japonica, that also has a rosette. Uh, leaf form that hugs the ground, so it's unlikely to get mown, but on the other hand, the flowers need to um, grow quickly, the flower stalk needs to grow quickly, uh, the plant has to flower and fruit all within a grass cutting cycle. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, there's a nice, oh, nice photos from Louise. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Um, here's a type of stress. So you notice in areas that are trampled, like say, for example, uh, a walkway, a shortcut to the bus stop, a shortcut to a block of flats. Uh, when you trample the soil and compact it, there's very little air and very little permeability of water and nutrients. So that is a type of very difficult um, habitat. And you see diversity tends to drop um, under such circumstances. So where there's less, um, uh, more favorable cir uh, circumstances, you can get higher diversity. And uh, where it's stressful, you, the diversity tends to drop. Next slide, please, Mei. Um, and what happens if you don't disturb the habitat, right? Because many, many people say, well, it's great that there's no grass cutting during the um, circuit breaker. Why don't we do that more often? That's the thing. If there's too much disturbance, that's stressful and, and I mean, that's difficult for most plants, and so the diversity drops. But if there's not enough disturbance, what happens is a few very competitive plants. In this case, on the, on the photo on the right, there's this what's called um, spiderwort, comalina. It's growing 30 centimeters tall, uh, tend to basically shade out any possible competitors. So you get kind of a monoculture of, of um, spiderwort. So too much disturbance, not so good. Not enough disturbance also tends to lower diversity a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. I think we're coming to the end of the uh, slide deck soon. Um, again, to, to colonize ephemeral habitats like these weedy plants do or wildflowers do, they, they, are, um, they have an advantage if they can reproduce early, you know, flower quickly, set lots of seeds, and disperse effectively. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see a couple of examples there's Cupid's shaving brush on the right, and then there's the buttonweed on the left, and the purple vernonia. All of these have dandelion type um, parachute like fruits which disperse very widely, so they're really effective at getting around. And they, they're so light that, and, and uh, buoyant in the, in the breeze that they can go long distances. The buttonweed is also really interesting because it doesn't even need pollination. It's, it's a plant, it's called apomictic. In other words, it can set seed without any pollination. So in a way it's clone, it's clonal, but it's a very effective, um, has a very effective genetic structure. So it works well and it just propagates and spreads and it's one of the world's most successful tropical weeds. Uh, thank you. And um, next slide, please. There's, there's some flowers again from Louise. Thank you very much, Louise. And, um, you notice, I mean, if you look carefully, you can see how plants with the different strategies. So take a look. There's a young Vernonia with the rosette leaves on the left and a slightly older one on the right. And you can see that this thing has been cut back at least three times where, where it's, um, um, you can see where some of the stem has died back where it was cut. And finally, one, one branch has 
lifted itself up above the lawn and it was success able to reproduce. So if the mowing is so frequently, you know, so frequent that the plant cannot make enough resources to grow again, then eventually it dies off. So there's again this trade-off between um, uh, disturbance, frequency, and intensity. Okay, next um, slide, please. And so maybe things to think about uh, before we go for the walk now, which is, can these, how can we maintain these areas for higher wildflower diversity? And if we have higher wildflower diversity, that might imply higher animal diversity, more butterflies, more bees, more other things that can, that need flowers for, for nectar or pollen can thrive. And this makes our urban landscape that much more richer and endearing. Okay, next slide, please, uh, May. I think it'll say, let's go for a walk. So I'm gonna rejoin you in a minute. Um, thank you very much and, and see, you, see you in my neighborhood. Okay. So here I am at a typical grassy verge, but you can see that this has not been cut for a while because it, everything's pretty long. Um, here is a purple vernonia. See, the, the leaves are rosette, growing really close to the ground, but this has grown very quickly. And here it's about 30 centimeters tall. Here's a type of milkweed, uh, Euphorbia. And here is the coat button tridax. So, so you can see where it's not cut, everything starts to really grow very quickly. Yeah, I'm just gonna keep walking. Bien, if you have anything to add. Hi, yes, finally I'm unmuted. Sorry uh, about that, Bien, I don't know what happened. No, it's because I have two devices, it's confusing. Um, so, oh yeah, yeah, this big grass is nice. I think it's probably a panicum of some sort. So this has a, a different uh, lifestyle or different growth habit. After being mowed, <laughs> it's just growing up really big. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to walk a little bit because I'm upsetting this neighbor's dog. <laughs> you see now, again, some, sometimes these weeds, you don't know where they, I mean, wildflowers, you don't know where they come from. So here is a type of a bean called puraria. But what we know about beans is that they fix nitrogen so they can thrive in very poor uh, conditions. Here is this Oldenlandia. I don't know if you can see it, uh, which is the flavoring for the white snake grass. <laughs> yeah, it was not very authentic, was it? Um, and here is uh, Vernonia. So you see, it becomes a very mixed kind of community without anybody really trying. And what's also interesting is sometimes evolutionarily, these weeds have never met before. Some are from Africa, some from Asia, some from Latin America. I'm gonna show you a little experiment that I took, I did the other day. Okay, so there's a 50 by 50 cm area. I'm gonna just point it out with my fingers. It started here to here. And you, can you see there's a little square? So I cut this on Sunday, which was only four, four or five days ago. And it's already um, the sedge, Cyperus has really elongated. So you can see the strategy. Some are still staying low, like this, um, this little Desmodium staying low. Um, and so, so is this cow grass. But the sedge is trying to expand very quickly, as to this Phylanthus. So they have very different responses to disturbance. If you don't cut, these guys will, some of they will uh, overtop the, cut the grass or the dismodium and, and they might be shaded out eventually. Um, this rest of the area was mown on Monday and um, the mower didn't cut as intensely as I did. Um, so it, it may favor a different type of strategy. I'll just keep walking. And uh, here's an area where I actually cut the tridax. You notice I stuck a stick in the ground to mark the spot. But the tridax didn't really recover, whereas the sedge in the previous plot grew right back. These guys are still staying very low. So its strategy clearly is not to grow quickly. It must require some lower level of mowing in order to, to thrive. And I would guess that 
regular mowing would would be really would really be bad for the uh, coat buttons. I don't know if you want to add to that, Dan. Um, sorry, I was replying to a chat about the olden land here yeah, because uh, as you were walking, there was a question about medicinal plants uh, of the um, medicinal qualities of the wildflowers, and you had okay. mentioned olden land here. Yeah. Right. So can you see there's some sparrows? So they're loving the seeds and everything. Uh, I see day flying moth. There were some butterflies around here. Let me cover the camera. So uh, me is showing it. Yes, this is the one where he cut on 20th of September. And the okay, next one. Yep. Uh, the next slide will show the next day where there's already some regrowth. Um, so you can still see it's very distinct, but, but today it, it wasn't very clear at all. This is uh, on Wednesday. Um, so very interesting. Now, if you can, if you can cut to my camera feed, uh, maybe. So, so again, here, here growing low is the carpet grass together with this desmodium, which is this bean family. Again, it can thrive on very poor soils because it's a bean. Notice how the sedge has just elevated itself and it's quickly flowered. This is the flowering stalk. So its strategy is clearly to grow quickly, seed, and then uh, the lawnmower can come, but then it doesn't matter, it will ha have already reproduced. I don't know how many days it takes, sorry for the butt. I don't know how many days it takes for this, this uh, Vernonia to extend, but look, it, 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 all the leaves are near the ground and then suddenly it shoots up flowers and fruits. Oh, did you see that? Here were some seeds I kind of let go. Uh, maybe they'll go colonize my neighbor's place or something. Just looking for my... And then if you can carefully look, Vienna, I don't know what you noticed, but there's a really? lot of species in here. Yeah, I. what struck me also was the way the Vernonia keeps its leaves close to the ground so that it can photosynthesize and, and make carbohydrates so that in between the mowing it can send up the flowers um, to rise yeah. above the above the other plants so that when the seeds are shed they can actually fly further because there's a little bit of height above the ground so that's that that kind of a strategy disperse. before i move on yeah yeah and this is see again uh this modium growing very low down here Here's and the there's milkweed. Euphorbia, herta, euphorbia, that's right. Yes. It's kind of lifting its head up above a little bit, but still hedging its bets. It's kind of growing a little bit close, whereas the sedge has really gone for it. Yeah. And then um, here's some young spider warts, and these Overline. have the potential to grow really tall. I okay, remember so. when, when I was a child, my mom would make us weed. Uh, some of the grassy patches and she said we had to get the roots out as well and so I think that's another strategy that the, the plant for, um, keeps all its strength in the root so that even though it's mowed or, or grazed or chewed the plant can still re-sprout from the roots I remember my mom saying if you just leave any little bit of the roots the, the several plants can sprout from the remaining roots that we didn't pull up that's right, especially like nut grass, which is a type of sedge, right? Mm, yes, yes. Okay, let me show you something different. This is a, this is a small little, it's cute, it's, a, it's called justicia. I don't oh, know if you can see it. Pretty white flowers. Yeah, and it's just on the edge, right next to the, right next to the sidewalk. Now, on the edge, very few people step on it, and there's actually, I, I shouldn't dig this up, but it's not so compact at all. So it seems like this kind of these edge habitats where the soil is less compacted seems to seems to favor some species more than others. Whereas if you go in the middle, where people are treading more more frequently, uh, soil might be more compacted. Now these, of course, I'm just speculating, but these can all be tested. These are great little experiments that you could do with just out of curiosity or with the children or with anybody, the child and all of us would like to know. Here's, here's an area. This looks like, if I'm not mistaken, this looks like a sensitive plant is coming up. So where do all these things come from? You know, it's, it's always very, very um, uh, perplexing to me. Let me go to an area where it's a little bit uh, 
let me try to find some hemigraphists. I'll be right back. So Sean mentioned where do these plants come from? And I think, and he, we just looked at the mimosa and that has kind of hairy bean pods. And the Des Desmodium as well in the bean family, they also have hairs. And I suspect that maybe the birds who would spread them, they would stick on to feathers. Little fragments of the beans would break into smaller bits, each with their own seed. And, and I think, I suspect mm -hmm. the bird uh, dispersed. Now there might be some subhabitats in some of these areas, Bien, right? So we saw two larger uh, euphorbia earlier, milkweed, which were not milkweeds, uh, spurge, which yeah. were maybe about 10, 15 centimeters high. But this one, which is growing through a crack in the pavement, is always flat. This one looks always like, yes, the thyme-leaved uh, euphorbia, euphorbia right. thyme folia. Yeah, that's very flat. You know, so even though they're related, they, they clearly have different kinds of strategies and how they want to do what they do. And then again, I think this is a little oldenlandia right here, small. Small guy. Yes, with its opposite leaves. Oh, tiny white flower, yeah. I think I see. Yes. So some plants like this Oldenlandia are capable of growing tall, but they can also grow very short. So in other words, they they are more flexible in their development and they can respond. Some can flower very low and some flower at a much taller height. Now let me go to another spot and I'll be right back. Yeah, this Desmodium is one of those that has um, furry pods which I think might might be dispersed by the birds that they stick on to the feathers. And um, and it's beautiful how it's intergrowing with the cow grass, with the carpet grass, exonopus. So as, as Sean mentioned before, it's, you know, when there's competition, when there's uh, in between the mowing, then it seems like these plants are competing with, with each other. Um, and they're growing into each other, which I think is actually very beautiful. I love the textures, the grass and this desmodium. And though, can you see the purple flowers? They are little tiny pea flowers, which are very pretty uh, in themselves. Too bad we can't pollinate this one right now, Bian. That's another fun thing to do. Um, I've got a desmodium in the in the feed at the moment here. If you take a look, so uh, where I have it, uh, <laughs> I got it. There's some inside here, but again, see, here's that strobilanthes or hemigraphus. See how flat it's growing, uh, whereas it's an, its neighbor. This is a really tiny cupid shaving brush, Emilia. I mean, it's oftentimes this thing can grow 50 centimeters, but here it's only 10. So again, they, if need be, if the in, depending on the frequency of the disturbance, they may be able to flower at a much smaller height, like this. This also. Uh, what is this one beyond this is uh this Can is a little composite yeah, yeah that's right tiny yellow flowers and here is a purple vernonia look how tiny less than 10 centimeters and it's flowered so so there is a certain amount of flexibility in some of these species and others are kind of have a kind of fixed development and then you have things like this little gourd it looks like a bitter gourd relative that's just creeping along the ground looking for something to climb so these are surprising things. If you just look closely enough, you'll find that these are very diverse little patches of greenery. And we're going to go to a pandan now to show you what other kinds of weird things, not weird, interesting things can, <laughs> can, um, <laughs> can, can just appear out of nowhere. Okay, so I'll be right back. Yeah, on the left would be um, Eclipsera with the white flowers. And that, that has, that's a, a composite. That's also very plastic in the way it grows. It can be a a taller plant or when it's mowed very often it can form a little mat which you can kind of see that um it's it's kind of hugging the ground right by the the cement um sidewalk and on the right we've got um the purple flowers are the cupid's shaving grass uh shaving brush emilia um oh no no sorry that's that's vernonia they both look very similar yeah. with the purple flowers. And, the, and the, the plant right to the right with the compound looking leaves is um, um, Phylanthus, Phylanthus urinaria. So that too also is very plastic in the way it grows. It can be very tall. But the, um, there's a little horizontal plant that's growing kind of the middle bottom. That's the um, Comalina, the spiderwort. That's, that's very, very uh, creeping. But so, again, as 
there's two more slides away is, is the flower that Sean was talking about, the justicia. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me go to so, that. Let's go to that, and then I'm on standby over here. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's very nice, that justicia. See how this is, this is a close-up, but the flowers are kind of elevated, and I imagine that they are um, taking advantage of trying to, of the little bit of height, trying to get the pollinators in, uh, probably some bees. Okay, so okay, Sean, gonna, back to you. Okay, so here I am on one side of the pedestrian walkway. Again, it's a typical mowed area. But if you can see, there's a, there's a patch where the people are walking truck cut across the street, and the diversity just drops to cut the grass there. We'll go there in a second. I'm just going to cross the pedestrian walkway. Oh, look out, no PMDs, thank goodness. Okay. Um, here's a patch of pandan. And because this pandan is not so tight things seeds can get inside so what do we find we find here there is a little um wild cinnamon and interestingly i think the tree right above is a wild cinnamon so if it, if the seeds were to fall on the lawn which they invariably do uh, they get cut back but the seeds that fall into this pandan patch they have a little bit of protection and here's another thing it's a funny one. This is this is rambutan. I don't know if somebody was eating rambutan and spat it out, or it was brought by a bat because bats will sometimes roost in the trees above. And there's another rambutan. So everywhere you look, there's ecology in action. Is it doesn't have to be in the rainforest. It's, this is really just in a typical neighborhood like so many of us live in. Here's the. Sorry, that's a, I have a jerky walk. Right where it's trod on, compacted, poor nutrients, you just get the most hardy ones, which is here, just the axinopus, the carpet grass. I'm gonna show you uh, uh, another tree. So again, just, just go outside your home, look in the smallest little patch, and you'll see examples. So here, here's a shortcut. So where people walk, it's only carpet grass, but then we move just a little bit further away and the grass is a little bit higher and we should be seeing a slightly higher diversity of uh, wildflowers. There we go. A little bit more diverse where people aren't disturbing the site too much. Okay, now let me just cover this up and I'll walk to the next spot, but I'll be real quick. Actually, I'm never really that quick, but... Um, <laughs> We try, we try. I think it's interesting when you say that, you know, when there's a, a patch of higher diversity, and I'm always thinking in my mind, what makes it higher? Is And, and you mentioned less disturbance. But if there's, you know, if, there, if, if we swing the pendulum all the way to no disturbance, and then, yeah. then there's competition, and then, uh, then the diversity might go down. And if so in this patch, yeah, exactly, yes. Bian, you know, in this patch where I am is a little bit shaded because there's a couple of tall trees just above me. So again, it's not, not just a wildflower is a wildflower, a weed is a weed. They might require a little bit more moisture or less, uh, uh, or a little bit more light or less. And so even amongst this sort of weed community, they all have their special requirements. And it'd be really fun to just go, go around each of our neighborhoods and see if there's any kind of relationship between where a plant is and what kinds of diversity that you can find on it. Okay, so I'm just gonna, sorry everybody, there's Comalina, the spider wart over there. We are raging against the dying light, but we still have a few minutes. Oh, Asian penny wart right here. Interestingly, it never grows, hardly, hardly ever grows in the middle of a grass patch, but always in these sort of semi-protected areas I find uh, near the sidewalk. Bian, doesn't this have medicinal value? Yeah, yeah, it's it's related to, to um, coriander and celery. Um, and and if, you've, if, if you go to um, the Burmese restaurants, they, they serve pennywort salad. So it's, go, it's also called go-to cola, and I think you can get the extract in shops. Uh, okay, so let me, let me oh let me just show you very quickly. Sorry, you might get dizzy, so maybe if you want to close your eyes first. So I'm going to just pan up to the canopy. This tree I'm standing squatting under. Huh, 
is a uh, tanjong tree, mimi sops. Mm. Fruit bats come to it at night. Where fruit bats come to feed, fruits bat will, fruit bats will also poo what's in their tummies already. And if we look at the bottom of this tanjong tree, look what I can find. I can find other bat dispersed things, like this is katapang sea almond. There's no katapang in sight of where I'm standing, and yet here's a sea almond. So who knows how many hundreds of meters or kilometers away it came from. This, Dan, you know what this is? That looks like a palm seedling. Huh? Yeah, this is oil palm, I think. Ooh. And there's no oil palm for kilometers away. And here's another oil palm. You know, so again, you can see ecology in action. This is a, this is a little passion, passion vine here, which is the food of the food plant of uh, Kangmin. What's this tawny cluster butterfly, this non-native? butterfly so again fascinating you just need to look and and ecology is everywhere um and again this is a shaded spot i'm going to move to one more place before i then hustle over to show you life by the expressway yes that's yeah. nice they, they look like little uh, water lily pads um with a little bit of a, a crenate margin or a tooth margin little round leaves um and it's it's also, it's actually a worldwide uh, weed, weed, I should say wildflower. <laughs> um, well, yes, and thank you. A, go ahead, Sean. No, keep going, Bian, sorry. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Oh, can, can I just then quickly, quickly show you a few things? I'm under a very large um, yellow flame. Beautiful. And again, if you look, it's, it's a place where birds and bats and things roost sometimes so let's look at what's under here you have the typical wildflowers like the um desmodium what's this uh dragon scale fern doing here i don't know yeah yeah here's a hemigraphus or strobilanthes but once again that oil palm <laughs> this uh -oh. is the noni mor morinda yes that's this medicinal is, uh, as well yeah yeah that's medicinal also I don't know if the bats are eating it for that purpose, but uh, where are you? There, there you are, Mr. Morinda. And then this is Sazygium, a, 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 oh. a plant, uh, right? Sazygium. And there's the Katapang, the sea almond. So just under one tree, uh, you can see there's all this kind of crazy stuff. The ne neighboring tree has this looks like a opposite leaf. So that's a, a trumpet tree. Rosy, yeah. yeah, rosy trumpet. Yeah, and, and there's another syzygium there at the base of this uh, chiku. So it's really incredible. Um, and I think I hit jackpot on the strobilanthes, the uh, hemigraphus, this whole, once, once they establish, and as long as people keep mowing it down, they will slowly spread as other plants get their leaves cut off and make less food. Um, I'm going to run over across the street. Going to check the rush hour traffic. Yeah, so while that's... Sean is doing a short walk, maybe Ben can talk about um, some of the plants as we, uh, as may flip through the slides. Okay, so this hemigraphus, we usually find it in shady, shady areas, but shady but dry, which is kind of an unusual com combination because usually in shady places, it's it tends to be more moist. Um, but perhaps because it's more, um, it's windy or the soil is very shallow and dries out faster. So this, this gives the hemigraphis or strobilanthus uh, an advantage over other plants and it can establish itself even under low light. And maybe later on, Sean could actually turn one of the leaves over and it's actually quite red underneath, which is an adaptation to lower light, low light levels. Okay, yeah. maybe next, next slide, maybe. In the pandanas, that's really interesting how the pandanas is a uh, kind of a nursery for younger plants. Yeah, yes, thank you. So you've got the cinnamon, the wild cinnamon seedling on the left and on the right is the rambutan. So so because the, the mowers don't mow the pandanas all the way down to the ground, so a lot of these other uh, plants can get established with the higher the higher mowing height. The poor pandan okay. looks a little bit um, mowed. The poor ends of the leaves are all all cut. 
Okay, we can we can go to the next slide. No, the okay, pandemic I'm, edible, someone had asked. Go ahead, Sean. Okay, sorry. So this is something that I, I actually didn't realize. I didn't even know it until a couple of days ago, thanks to you and Louise. This is something called Fatua, I think it's in the mulberry family, a small little beautiful wildflower, and I don't even know where it's native to. Uh, it's got a little bit of milky sap, like, like members of its family. And uh, here is the young gear, the little hawkweed. Do you see that, the yellow flower? Uh, wow, there you are, the little young gear. And again, this is an area that's clearly not mown that often, and it's shady. So you get a little bit of different kind of diversity here. Now I'm going to walk up. Life in the big city. I'm just going to walk slowly across the expressway. It's Friday. So, um, sorry, guys. All these people going into town, they could be stopping and looking at wildflowers. <laughs> but what's interesting about these roadside verges is sometimes these areas don't get cut, obviously, because they're not so accessible. So I was thinking maybe we could go down, have a quick look, and see what comes up in such areas that have minimal mowing. And I'm just going to go down the stairs and cover up. And who knows, maybe we'll be surprised at what we find. I'm next to a school, so there's clearly a school garden. But if I look down, just over here, in this little space between the fence and the stairwell, can you see that's a, you, you recognize that, Jim? Yeah, looks like a pulai, one of the Yes, a pulai which is this great big um, wayside, you know, street side tree, it has a fruits which float in the wind, can go long distances. And it clearly found a really nice spot that possibly has similar type of, uh, conditions to the rainforest that normally called home. A little bit of shade, but lots of indirect light. Um, it's sort of the humidity is locked in a little bit by its uh, relatively uh, sheltered spot. And fascinating. But I am right under a uh, breadfruit tree. And so the breadfruit, I think there's some baby breadfruits just down here. They're really kind of cute. Oh, there's another pool eye. Can you see that? Uh, that's, and there is a breadfruit, which has probably just fallen from above. But again, these places um, are really interesting very seldom mown. Remember what we were saying earlier, here's a centipede grass, but where there's very little mowing, one or two species just start to grow tall and outcompetes everything else. So th I think there's a sweet spot between too much ma management, which lowers the diversity, or not enough management, which also lowers the diversity. And what uh, Noel Kang Min and a few others in the butterfly group are trying to do is to do a few studies to see what type of frequency and intensity of mowing can optimize the wildflower diversity. And so if you want to participate in some of these um, citizen science projects, you know, contact the butterfly group. Um, here is a uh, purple Cleome. We haven't seen too many of these today. Um, well, there's a really grow. tall specimen. Yeah, not too bad, but, but you know, I, I'm getting old, right? So I, I take off my glasses when I'm looking at the screen, but then I, but then I can't see in front of me. So now I'm going to put my glasses back on. And again, it's a really mixed thing about, you know, tr there's some tree seedlings, some wildflowers, and let me go over here. I really want to thank Beng Chia, Meiyi, Bien, of course, Carrie for making all of this possible. Unbeknownst to these many thousands of drivers going by, there's a lot of ecology going on here. This little bent plant there, that's a um, trumpet tree. Again, wind dispersed. It's a rainforest plant from South America. Um, and it finds a kind of rainforest-like habitat here. 
um, at this verge next to the expressway with this very minimal management. There's another palm here, the MacArthur palm from New Guinea, also a rainforest species. Uh, nobody planted it, the birds brought it, and it's thriving. So again, one would think if there was really no management at all, I guess much of Singapore would just revert back to um, rainforest. Um, before I end, I, I suppose Bien, myself, Bang can take questions, but I just wanted to thank all of you for spending a Friday evening with us to learn about wildflowers. I guess if there's a takeaway message is that this diversity is everywhere. It's for us to enjoy. You don't need to be in the most pristine habitats. Oh, look, there's a gorilla garden in the back there I just discovered next to the expressway. I see tapioca and yam and sweet potato, papaya. Um, see where there's very, with kind of boating who kind of place and <laughs> creativity slides. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and go to a quiet place to answer questions. But Diana, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, everyone, for your, so for your enthusiastic participation. We love sharing and uh, happy to do um, these, um, these walks uh, with you. Okay, thank you thank very you much so and much. have a wonderful weekend. Maybe while we take the question, uh, May, you can switch it to the PowerPoint from slide 70 onwards. So we will just slowly run through the slides. They are actually a clearer picture of what Sean has shown just now in the video form. They are photographs that he has taken just a few days ago. So you can see it is sharper. And maybe as we wait for the question to roll in, um, May, you can run through the slide. And Bien, just jump in any time to talk about these plants. Okay, yeah, I think it's just, yeah, very quickly. There's the breadfruit, and there's a climbing fern on the right, growing up the fence, um, and that pudlai seedling, which I imagine will one day become a big tree if it's left to its own devices. That's another one. And a little rain tree just at the top of the picture as well, just next to yeah, the Yeah, and for people who don't know what a, a pudlai looks like, that's just a picture that we grabbed from Ann Parks. It, it actually grows to be a quite tall and we do have a lot of roadside trees that are pulai species. Thanks, me. So that's the seedling of the rain tree, right, Bien? Yes, that's it. Not much space for it to grow, but nature finds a way. And the mimosa, the mimosa seeds. I guess the, how, how did they get there? The rain tree um, pods up, the, have an edible pulp, so I think the squirrels and uh, probably spread them. And the mimosa has these um, hairy, sticky pods, which I think the birds will spread as well. So I'm just back on audio, happy to help help you be and answer any questions. Um, uh, I was just reminded of a website I read where they quoted the American writer Walt, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, "A weed is a plant whose virtues have yet to be discovered." Very Something nice. Like that. Yes. Yep. Well, there's a bit quite quiet. I think that we still have the same few questions that was asked earlier. Um, there's a question that asked, like, some dandelions are supposed to be edible. What about the common ones that we usually come across? We don't quite yeah. have dandelion here, right? Yeah, we don't. We don't. It needs a, a cooler, more seasonal climate. It's found in the mountains in, in our region. And it's uh, it's it's a it's a worldwide weed, actually, but the, the, the climate has to be cooler. So yes, people do eat uh, dandelion leaves. Um, and I and also, if you all know, lettuce is also in the same family. So that's edible. Um, so interestingly, Bian, you know, the dandelion, like our button weed, it, it's, it's a so-called apple mix. It, it doesn't require uh, pollination. It just sets mm -hmm. seeds on its own. and. Again, there's, if you want to talk about characteristics of plants that lend themselves to this kind of ruderal or disturbance-related lifestyle, um, the, not just growth, but also the reproductive strategy uh, could be the key to its success also. Right, right. So there's a question from you um, about whether we have a project on studying wildflowers. I think Sean just mentioned uh, Kamin, which is in the butterfly group. They're kind of interested. Come in. Do you want to say something about the project? Are you ready to share yet? Oh. Um, 
We're still talking and discussing with NTAC, so it's, it's not ready, but uh, we could have a project that studies both the wildflowers and, and the butterfly communities to look at whether um, if you change the frequency of mowing the grass, so if you leave, if you mow, let's say you mow every two months or you mow every four months, six months, does it change the grass community and um, how does that affect the butterfly community in turn and also other insects like bees and dragonflies? You know, Kangmin, I was just thinking we could set up a sort of wildflower um, um, group on iNaturalist, right? Where people can just sort of send in their photos of these wildflowers and, and eventually we could kind of document where, where, where and under what conditions do different species seem to do best. Yeah, that's a really great idea. And uh, maybe we can send this to, to all people who are on this, um, who kindly um, attended this virtual walk. Maybe we can send out some information. Yeah, yeah, we, we can do that. So you could be monitoring these grass patches anywhere, anywhere near, near your house. Yeah, and, uh, so that reminds me if you can all uh, give your feedback in this link here, and we will get back to you if you are interested in any of these projects. Thanks, Carmen. Sorry, Sean, you were going to say something before I interrupted. No, I'm going to, I was just about to say the, the evening is lovely. It's, it's not, it doesn't look like it's going to rain. It's nice and cool. The soft, gentle light of the start of, heralding the start of a weekend. What better way to end the week? Thank you very much, Dang, Dian, Mei Yi, everybody. There's a, actually a question, a growing question. I, I'm not sure. Bien, do you see the question about Santella? Um, someone tried to grow it a few times, but they never survived. Do you know what kind of condition do they need to grow? It's in, in, in Florida, that's uh, where I work. It was considered a wetland plant. It was a wetland indicator, so um, it likes wet soils. Uh, and it can grow in full sun or even in shady conditions. So perhaps the, the, the sunlight, but I think more importantly, it's the moisture regime. Um, perhaps um, more watering might help. But it's, yes. it's, it's very difficult to say without really knowing uh, what your experience was and, and whether it was insects or whether it was something else. I would imagine sort of moist, but not waterlogged, but moist, well-drained soil. Uh, uh, because they don't seem to be thriving in these compacted areas, but it's always kind of the edge of a verge or under a tree or something like that. Okay. Forest soil. Mm. Maybe May you can um, tell the group about the iNaturalist um, project that we have in NSS because I can see a comment about, um, I, I think it's from Bibi who mentioned, yeah, Carrie also talked about the Singapore na nature sightings. Do you want to say something, May? You're muted. Oh, sorry. Hi. All right. So Nature Society right now, we have this iNaturalist project called Singapore Nature Sightings iNaturalist project that Carrie shared the link. So it's really very easy to use. Um, you can download it as a mobile app whereby you can upload your photograph and make sure to join the project first so that your observations will be reflected. And then um, iNaturalist is very helpful if you are unable to identify on your own because they have this um, AI that's able to suggest the identity based on the photograph you upload. And even if the AI doesn't work, there's a community of um, experts online who can help you to verify. So that's a way for you to go about learning to identify and discover the wildflowers around us. Yep. Thanks, May. Yep. Um, actually, I just want to thank everyone who came in because I could see from the chat that it was really a nice community. People were helping to answer questions. I can see Jack trying to answer some of the questions. It's, it's so wonderful to see everybody chipping in what you know. Um, yes, I can't wait when the circuit breaker is over and we can have a big group and we should really go for a walk outside. So, um, there doesn't seem to be any other question. Oh, Oliver wants to know how has COVID impacted activities that NSS conducted? Um, in relation to the COVID, I think all of us have realized how much we miss connection to nature. <laughs> This really has taught us what is important in life, and, and we miss that. And I've missed, certainly missed it out. And I've restricted myself so much for a few months. And um, now that we can go out, it really does feel like, um, like um, I can get my connection back to nature, which I really appreciate. And I, I hope all of you feel the same way as, as I do. 
Yeah, you're right, Ian, isn't it? I mean, often we talk about nature as something that's good to have, but clearly what this has shown us is it's really a need to have for so many of us. But, but I think if, if, if any of you are interested in particular topics related to plants or, you know, whether they be wildflowers or anything else, uh, please, please let us know and, and we'll see how we can how we can do those. I mean, again, uh, Singapore with nature is a better Singapore and, you know, nature takes all forms. I must say this is the first time I think in the history of Sean's walk that he ended on time. <laughs> All right, all right. I, I have turned a new leaf, Bing Chuck. I've turned a new leaf. You leave no leaf unturned. All right, all right. Okay. We didn't so, see corn today, but now we have it. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you have any question or anything, please do um, email us. And please, we will appreciate the feedback if you could um, just drop us a note. Thank you very much. Thank you, nice everyone. You. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Thanks, Sean. Yeah.